Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the Dynamic Cold Store webinar. My name is uh, Judith Evans, uh, I'm from London South Bank University. Uh, we have two parts to the presentation. Uh, I'm starting off with an introduction to some of the cold store technologies available and some of the background information that may be relevant. I'm then going to pass on to Pat Morn from Hubbards, who's going to talk a bit about some examples and case studies uh, on cold stores. And we'll follow that by a Q&A. So if you've got any questions, please note them down. We're very happy to answer them at the end of the presentations. So I'd just like to start a little bit with some of the basics, um, because I think some of this is quite important to understand. Uh, if you have a cold store like the diagram on the right, uh, you're going to have a number of heat loads on that cold store. These can come from things like transmission, which is the heat load across the insulation, from infiltration, which is heat coming in through the doorways, or if you had a particularly leaky cold store from any gaps in the insulation. You've also got heat loads from lights, from fans, from people going into the store, any machinery going into the store, such as forklifts, and maybe even the food itself, if you actually load the food at above the temperature of the cold store. So things like the transmission are quite related to location and orientation of the cold store and the thickness of the insulation. So you need to really understand for your cold store where those heat loads are coming from. So I'll show you in a minute, these can be quite different. Also, you need to take into account how efficiently you extract those heat loads and that's the job of the refrigeration system. So you need to look at how efficiently the refrigeration system removes that heat from the cold store. And that's usually defined as a coefficient of performance, or if you're including everything in the calculation, which includes fans, lights, etc., it might be a coefficient of system performance. So I'd like to just show you how some of these heat loads actually vary because it's very important to be able to understand where the different heat loads are coming from. Because if you don't understand where the heat loads are coming from, you can't then define which technology is going to be best for your particular cold room. So I'm showing on the graph here seven different cold rooms. These are all from the same operator. They're on the same site. But you can see that there's a lot of variability in the different heat loads. And so we have heat loads from food, people and forklifts, doors, insulation, and fixed uh, heat loads from lights and fans. So you can see, for example, that in room three, you have a high heat load from the doors, the infiltration. It's relatively high in room four, but in a lot of the other rooms, for example, room one and room two, it's very low. So if you were actually looking at technologies that were going to reduce infiltration, they might be very viable in room three and four, but they wouldn't really have much feasibility in room one and two. Uh, I mean, we're also looking at uh, things like in room four, people and forklifts have got a reasonably high heat load. So if you understand where that heat load's coming from, maybe something like automation may have some benefits in that room, but it's going to have very little benefit in room one or room two. Uh, you can also see in some of the rooms, for example, room, room five, you've got a high heat load from lights and fans. And so, for example, in that room, you may benefit from looking at LED lights or reducing your lighting or putting in more efficient fans. Whereas in room three, although it's still a relatively high heat load, it's nothing like the heat load in room five. So it's not the top thing you'd be looking at to reduce in room three, but it definitely in room five, you would be looking at the fixed heat loads from lights and fans and reducing those. So it's really important to actually align your technologies with the need of that particular store. You can also see as well that the heat loads can vary over time. So the graph I showed you before was showing you really an average heat load over a long period of time. And in this graph, you can see the heat load varies over uh, a, often a daily cycle, for example, in terms of the insulation. But you can see the heat load from doors varies quite considerably. Uh, so you also have to take this into account and also uh, maybe align your technology to certain times of the day if that's important. Uh, and you need to really understand the heat loads in your cold store to be able to actually apply the very best technology. 
In terms of energy efficiency, uh, you can see probably from the previous slides that there isn't really one generic one fits all approach. So uh, there's a lot of different technologies that you probably have to look at and find out which is the best one for your particular store. So we looked at this in a previous project uh, where we looked at how much energy you could save in cold stores. And we found that on average over about 38 stores, which we examined in detail, we could save about 30% of the energy. But uh, all the options to save energy were very different in each of the stores. And you can see in the graph on the right hand side all the different options that we looked at and the savings that could be made. You can also see standard deviations on the graph and you can see that there's big differences between the minimum and the maximum type of savings we make. One of the things that did come out was that service and maintenance is very important. And so it's very important to understand performance and how that changes over time. Quite often a lot, in a lot of the stores we found that the store had probably been very well designed and actually had been set up very well when it was first installed. But the problem really had occurred over time where people had made small changes that had accumulated and it ended up by being quite major changes in how the store actually performed. And so it's very important to actually monitor how the store is performing so you can actually see where the performance is changing and to stop any um, degradation in performance relatively quickly rather than letting it get to quite a poor level, which we often saw in some of the stores that we looked at. We also looked at uh, how you could actually improve some of the, the stores in terms of energy performance. I mean, the first option is always to reduce the heat loads. And we talked a little bit about uh, the different heat loads and how they vary between stores earlier. But you do need some knowledge to be able to select the best technologies. And what we looked at is we looked at the type of level of information you need to be able to apply new technologies. And we actually found that in about 24% of cases, as shown in the graph on the right hand side, that you don't need necessarily a high technical knowledge to be able to find out what those technologies are and be able to apply them. So a user with some level of knowledge can identify quite a few of the technologies and apply them. But you also then have uh, a higher level of knowledge that's required to be able to analyze how the refrigeration system's working, to do more calculations on the heat loads and to actually do the measurements. If you had a refrigeration engineer, uh, we found that in 43% of cases, they'd be able to find and solve the problem. But in 33% of cases, we found that you needed a real specialist to be able to analyze the data. So somebody that had real detailed engineering knowledge. One of the things we found is that in most of the cases, uh, there was a financial case to justify the investment. But obviously, when you're looking at new technologies, you have to be able to justify that technology in terms of a good financial payback. And we also found that some savings cost actually very little, hardly anything at all, and you needed very little technical knowledge to actually apply them. So it's actually a good idea to look first at the simple heat loads and then maybe work up into a more detailed analysis to be able to save even more energy. I also wanted to mention uh, carbon emissions because um, the emissions don't come just from energy and indirect, but also from direct emissions as well, which are most often from the refrigerants used in the cold store. Most large cold stores are going to operate using ammonia, but smaller stores may operate using a hydrofluorocarbon, an HFC. And it's important now with F-gas and phase down of HFC refrigerants to make sure that you're using a low global warming potential refrigerant, particularly if you're changing refrigerant or building a new cold store. So you need to look at using a, a low GWP refrigerant, uh, possibly some of the new refrigerants that are coming onto the market if you can't use a low, very low GWP refrigerant such as ammonia. So looking at HFC, HFO blends, which will have low GWP. And so there's really quite some quite significant challenges for the industry to comply with the deadlines uh, for phase down in HSC refrigerants and to use 
things like the HFO with the refrigerants, which are actually mildly flammable refrigerants. So if you're looking at new cold store and installing new uh, a new facility, uh, really need to also take into account the refrigerant that you're using and to make sure that you're future proofed. So that was the basics. So after the basics, what actually is available? I've listed here a set of technologies that I'm going to talk about a little bit. They're not necessarily exclusive, but they're perhaps some of the ones that are, are near a market, some of the ones that you could look at. So I'm going to look at storage, uh, looking at grid balancing, demand side management, uh, integrating cold stores uh, into local facilities, use of renewable energy sources, uh, packaging, robotics and automation, and novel technologies. So in terms of storage, uh, cold stores are actually uh, very good batteries. In a cold store, you have a lot of food, and this acts as a thermal store. Uh, especially in frozen stores, you've got the ability to be able to reduce the temperature in the cold store uh, well below your set point level if you wish to, and to then switch the cold store off and use the food in the cold store as a battery to maintain the temperature within the store. It's quite common in frozen cold stores to do what's called load shedding, uh, which is basically demand side management where you switch the cold store off at uh, peak grid demand times so that uh, you sometimes uh, either save money by uh, using cheaper electricity and not using electricity which is expensive at peak times. Or in some cases, you can be actually remunerated by the grid to switch your cold store off at that time. You can see in the graph on the right hand side, which is showing time against the actual energy used by the cold store. You can see that uh, at certain times they are switching this cold store off when the uh, graph lines go down. So between about 8 o'clock and midnight, they're actually switching off the cold store. But before that, they run the cold store uh, to reduce the temperature of the food inside it, uh, then switch it off and then let the temperatures start to warm up very gradually, but very slowly because you have a huge thermal inertia in the store. And by doing that, they're avoiding the peak tariffs, which are sometimes around six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, and they may be remunerated by the grid for actually doing so. So this is which basically what is called arbitrage. You save money, but you don't necessarily save energy and carbon. But there is some indication that you can also you can actually save energy. Uh, in terms of work that's been done, there's been some work done in France by uh, an institution called Erstia, and they've looked at predictive control uh, for cold stores and being able to switch them off at peak uh, energy tariff times. And they found in a model that they also saved 10% of the energy, as well as making financial savings and this is quite possibly because, particularly in large cold stores, it's more efficient to run the, the refrigeration system at full capacity. It's not very efficient to unload compressors or run them at part capacity. And so probably what they're doing is they're running the refrigeration system more efficiently. They may also be doing more uh, refrigeration at night rather than day. So it's much more efficient to run a refrigeration system at night when it's cooler. So there are potentially financial and also energy savings to be made by running the cold store in certain ways. If you actually also include thermal storage, this may also enhance the opportunities. So in the next slide, I started to look a little bit at thermal storage. You get daily and annual variations in temperature. You can see in the graph on the right hand side, uh, this is some data just from a cold store we worked with. Uh, showing the annual variation in electrical energy consumption and or the lower slide showing the variation uh, on a daily basis, showing the average and the mean uh, daily energy consumption. So you can see it varies quite widely, uh, both on a daily and on an annual basis. And as I said, if you can run your refrigeration system in colder weather, it actually runs more efficiently you'll save about 2 to 3% of the energy for every K reduction in, in the condensing temperature. So you, if, for example, you can run your cold store more at night and less during the day, it's going to be more efficient. 
but to do that you probably need some means of storing energy and one means of doing that is to use a phase change material uh, which is used to store energy so you use the night at night time you use your energy to uh, reduce the temperature in the cold store and also to reduce the temperature of that phase change material in the day you use that phase change material to uh, give you cooling in the cold store and again there's some work done uh, by uh, these guys in Erstia and they've shown this is in a model 17 to 33 percent en energy savings when they actually modeled a cold store so there's potentially also some savings using phase change materials and I think Pat's also going to talk a little bit about phase change materials in his talk there is also another benefit as well because potentially you may also get better food quality in terms of chilled stores you can't really reduce the temperature and load shed in the way that I described earlier because you can't reduce the temperature and freeze the food so you have a much lower margin uh, of temperature range that you can operate over in a chilled store whereas in a frozen store you can reduce the temperature but for some foods it's not actually that great to uh, fluctuate the temperature of the food too often and so if you can actually maintain the temperature of the food at more stable uh, and uh, lower range of fluctuations potentially you have better quality for some food as well so in terms of the food quality uh, some foods are especially sensitive to temperature fluctuations a good example is, is ice cream and you can see on the right hand side uh, what tends to happen is you build up ice crystals and also the ice the ice cream can become quite grainy when you actually taste it you can actually feel the ice crystals on your tongue and this is caused by what's called Oswald ripening where smaller crystals um, recrystallize and become larger and so this is actually enhanced by temperature fluctuation and so something like ice cream you have to keep at quite tight temperature fluctuations whereas other foods are not affected by temperature fluctuations very much some work's actually been done looking at a, a predictive controller which coupled a phase change material uh, to reduce uh, temperature fluctuations they actually found that uh, if you stored ice cream for 90 days the ice crystals remained below about 26 microns which is the sort of level you need to be before you can actually start feeling the ice crystals on your tongue so if you can actually combine that predictive controller I described earlier with a phase change material and reduce the temperature fluctuations you can actually improve the, the, the quality of the food as well another option is to uh, use thermal packaging uh, it's quite possible to actually reduce temperature fluctuations by putting packaging on product uh, and this is just uh, a simple phase change material like a eutectic type of pack like the one at the bottom of the uh, picture so you can actually provide a PCM shroud to stabilize the temperature of the product again there's been some work done which showed that if you actually apply a PCM shown in the graphs on the right hand side the impact on the temperature on the surface and the center of the ice cream is barely affected when you have a PCM shroud on a pallet of ice cream whereas if you don't have any insulation temperatures can rise quite quickly and so it's it's quite a good way of actually maintaining temperature and reducing temperature fluctuations and in trials a 10 millimeter thickness of uh, PCM was found sufficient to keep the ice cream frozen for at least 40 minutes so you can cut out a lot of the fluctuations that you might see in stores but there are some uh, practical difficulties you obviously have to charge that PCM and freeze it down before you use it and so if you're going to do that separately you then have to apply the shroud to the product and maybe take it off uh, so it's not exactly a particularly practical way of um, uh, storing your food but it is an interesting method that maybe you can improve food quality through using packaging integration is also another interesting area uh, as you can see in the picture on the top right a lot of cold stores uh, have solar panels on their roofs quite a good means to apply solar panels because cold stores usually have flat roofs and as long as the structure is strong enough you can apply solar panels across almost all the roof of a cold store 
and then that can be used either for energy locally or it can actually be used and put back into the grid. There's a greater proportion of power that's going to be generated from renewable energy sources in the future. You know, for example, the EU aims to generate 20% of the energy used from renewable sources by 2020, and this is increasing rapidly, so you know, easily 30% by 2030. So one of the issues with renewable energy sources is they don't necessarily supply a stable and steady generation. Solar panels will only provide energy when the sun is shining. If, for example, you use a wind turbine, you're only going to be producing energy when the wind's blowing. So these things are not necessarily wholly predictable long term. And so being able to store energy and use it at times when you don't have energy from those renewable energy resources is going to become increasingly important as renewable energy sources are taken up more and more. Cold stores can play a part in this either through thermal storage by using the energy when it's available to reduce the temperature of the store, particularly in frozen stores, or by storing energy via other vectors. It could be stored via electric batteries, uh, for example, which may be a good option for smaller stores. There's also options such as liquid air energy storage, or LAES, which is particularly a good option for larger stores. So uh, liquid air energy storage, like I said, it's a very good option for larger stores and it can actually aid grid balancing. What we can do by doing that, we can potentially decarbonize the energy electricity grid by actually using more renewable energy resources. We can actually store the energy in the liquid air and we can actually then use that to uh, supply back into the grid at peak power demands. Uh, you get tend to get in the UK peak power demands around about breakfast time and uh, in the early evening. So you can use that to uh, shave that peak demand, uh, which is when you bring in less carbon efficient power stations. And so you can make your grid use less carbon by actually providing energy back into the grid at those peak times. You can also potentially provide some free cooling to the cold stores as you generate using the liquid air. And there's also the potential facility to become a hub. Because what you can also do as well is not only uh, use that liquid air for generation on you, in the cold stores I mentioned, but there is a the potential to also use it in vehicles uh, cold stores obviously regularly have vehicles coming in and out, and so you can use the uh, liquid air uh, either in something like a Diemen engine, or you can use it in a direct expansion system uh, like the system that's used more by Air Liquid, where they expand the cryogen through a heat exchanger in the vehicle. You could also potentially use uh, the liquid air for fast freezing. Uh, often cold stores have associated food production facilities and they often have liquid nitrogen freezers. So using the liquid air system, either we could use liquid air or we could produce liquid nitrogen and use it for fast freezing. And one of the costs of liquid nitrogen is actually in the delivery and bringing it to the facility in the first place. So if it's actually produced on site, there's maybe some big benefits in being able to use it. And so you have a hub of different options that you can use and you can choose which to use at different times. And there may be different options that you'd select depending on the most efficient way of using that liquid air. Automation is also another option. As I said earlier, you need to look at your heat loads and to decide whether automation is actually uh, going to reduce your heat loads or alternatively, if it's going to be economic in terms of reducing manpower and health and safety. So the benefits really depend on the type of store. And this is something Pat's going to talk about a bit in his, his talk as well, because he's got some nice examples of automation. In terms of other novel technologies, uh, these are mainly refrigeration technologies. Uh, it's possibly worth looking at combined heat and power and tri generation depends really on the facility and whether it's going to be viable or not, but potentially if you need heating and cooling 
or can use that heat in an ad or absorption cooling system, uh, then may be very viable. If you have very low temperature uh, cold stores, such as uh, those used for tuna freezing in Japan, uh, they particularly have stores which uh, run at minus 60, which are used for tuna freezing. Air cycle may be quite an interesting option. That's where you use air as the refrigerant. So you're using a refrigerant that has basically no ozone depletion potential, very low global warming potential. It's non-flammable, it's non-toxic, so it's very safe to use. However, not necessarily the most efficient option at higher temperatures, but once you start getting to those lower temperatures, you start seeing that it actually is competitive. And there are some systems now that have been installed in Japan, and they don't actually use any fans in the cold room. So you can actually make some savings through the fan energy that's going into the cold store. And they mainly de separate the defrosting mechanism from the cold store as well. It's carried out remotely. And also, generally, these systems are very reliable. If, if you want a low temperature store, there may be some benefits in looking at air cycle. Most other refrigeration technologies are aimed at smaller scale systems. So systems like magnetocaloric, electrocaloric, they're all aimed really at uh, domestic, small commercial, uh, professional refrigeration systems. So at the moment, I don't think there's much uh, option to use them in cold stores. And most of the other options really are quite a long way away from the market and requiring quite a level of development. Hopefully that's a brief introduction uh, to cold stores and some of the technologies you could be looking at. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm now going to pass on to Pat Morn from Hubbards. He's got some fascinating examples uh, to talk to you about uh, to show you where technologies have been applied in cold stores. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. The dynamic cold store. Cold stores and storage offer the opportunity to use the thermal mass embedded within the stores, both within the store product and dedicated thermal batteries, to load shed power at high demand periods, and in reverse, consume wrong time power at periods where the supply of power is in excess of demand. This will become more the case as bigger proportion of electrical production is obtained from wind and power. Hi, I'm Pat Morn. I'm the Managing Director of Hubbard Products, and I am following on from my colleague Judith Evans to describe some applied examples of the dynamic cold store. The first subject I'd like to touch on is robotics in cold stores, and I'd like to present technology that has been brought to the marketplace by Ocado. Robotic in storage and customer fulfillment centers have brought about the ability for working in minimum workplace temperatures, suggesting the approved code of practice suggests that minimum temperature in a workplace should normally be at least 16 degrees Celsius. The work involves rigorous physical efforts where temperatures should be at least at 13 degrees Celsius. Cold stores are not comfortable places to work and require specific health and safety issues around them. In the photograph, you see the picture of Ocado's combined cold store and distribution center at Erith in Kent. And in the next slide, we will see the example of their pod construction of robotic pickers and placers. Ocado have developed hive technology which is where a number of robots work in unison, and re this represents a breakthrough in engineering. The first Ocado smart platform of hives went live in December 2016 and is located in Andover. It is designed to feature up to a, th a thousand robots working in a hive together on a grid roughly the size of a football pitch. The second combined cold store and distribution center in Erith is currently under construction and is projected to be three times the size of Andover. When opened, 
It will be the largest automated warehouse for online grocery in the world. It has no people on the floor whatsoever and has the ability at maximum to deliver 100,000 customer orders a week. As you can see from the image, products are retained within lidded crates containing solid CO2 once picked to keep the frozen products cold and then they are distributed in last mile vehicles to consumers. Within the cold store, Ocado products are stored, picked and dispatched using state-of-the-art automation and robotic system. They use a combination uh, of before of Hive individual robots and robot pickers working within a narrow aisle formation. A second area where coal stores are interesting for energy development is within the use of phase change materials. And I would like to look at some practical examples to further uh, explain Judith's presentation. Birmingham University have set up the Birmingham Energy Storage Institute. This center recognizes how energy storage, particularly thermal and cryogenic energy, based on technologies coupled with appropriate policies, could play an important role in delivering an integrated energy system. Storing cold and power is an important part of how we can make best use of the resource and also allows the storage of wrong time renewable energy to use in cooling applications. This includes novel materials and methods for storing cold and power, efficient insulation materials and methods and advanced materials used in manufacturing technologies. Thermal energy storage is one of the best candidates to reduce and optimize the energy use of refrigeration systems. Coupled with the control strategies as predictive controls approach, it can lead to a drastic reduction in energy consumption and a significant product quality enhancement. This is a quote from Van der Sluis, who is the leading proponent in this area and touches on the work that Judith proposed earlier. Another area of, of work that is very useful within cold stores is the stratification of temperature within the store. Energy use intensity in supermarket cold stores is high compared to retail buildings due to the refrigeration needed for the preservation of chilled and frozen products. However, these products do not, do not get stored within the complete mass of the building. So we need to provide cold energy where cold is required and we need to ensure that areas for picking and placing are maintained at the highest optimum temperature for human occupation. What we see is an EU funded project in this slide where we are looking at wind power production with energy storage through load shifting in refrigerated warehouses. This is the Night Wind project. Aimed to use refrigerated warehouse, warehouses as giant batteries for wind energy. In this way, all electricity produced at night time is effectively used as a peaking mechanism across Europe and then this energy would be released to the grid during peak hours in the day. In this slide we show the typical peaks and troughs in electricity demand throughout one week, winter weekday. This shows that we have in the high demand periods of breakfast time and tea time a, a demand that exceeds the, the potential for supply, but out of those hours, we have areas where we could store that energy. The dynamic cold store 
allows the external environment is rapidly evolving to, to due to the decarbonization, decentralization, and digitization. The operation of national electricity transmission systems is therefore becoming more challenging. The dynamic coal, coal store gives us options in this area. Thank you, and that concludes my part of the talk.